This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. For Christmas, I want a bow and arrow. Did you say that? Do you have a youngin that says that now? My bet is they already have one because they shoot archery at their school. One thing Kentucky does have new this year is our state archery coordinator, Lisa Fry. I'll introduce you. In our second half hour, we go inside archery with the national and world side to talk about scholarships, awards, and so much more. Tommy Floyd of the National Archery in the Schools program. It's all next on Kentucky Afield Radio. Getting back to nature? Remember those already there. This holiday season, buy and print the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife gift certificate right from your PC for anyone on your list who has outdoor adventure on theirs. Online at fw.ky.gov. Deer in the headlights. Watch out, Mr. Deer. <laughs> Singing with your kids in the car is one way to keep deer hazard season in mind. And should a deer catch your headlights, flash those lights, sound your horn, break its concentration to scurry it along. There's one. And where there's one, there may be two or three more. Deer hazard season runs through November. So be wise behind the wheel while nature runs its course. A message from Fish and Wildlife and the Kentucky Office of Highway Safety. Honey, what'd you get your brother? The Fish and Wildlife gift certificate. Fishing for ideas, hunting for gifts. Give the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife gift certificate for the person on your list with the great outdoors on theirs. Online at fw.ky.gov. Welcome to Kentucky Field Radio. This is Charlie Baglin. Kentucky has a new head coach. I'm not talking about basketball, but about a sport that collectively across the state, I'm willing to bet, has just as many fans. Kentucky has a new head coach in archery, Lisa Fry, and she's the new state coordinator for the National Archery in the Schools program, what we call NASP. She helps kids and school coaches hit bullseyes in archery and in life. And Lisa, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you. Jenny Richardson, and then we have Patrick O'Connell, and the third archery coordinator for the state of Kentucky, Lisa Fry. That's got got to be kind of cool. Oh, it's so cool. And the thought of the big shoes that I have to fill. Patrick did a good job. I heard the number 14,000 kids in the mix last year. We had 11,000 children compete in our regional tournaments. To go into state, only about 4,200 of those were allowed to compete in the state tournament. And the only reason that number is so small is the facility would have only hold that many. That's right. You had to cut it off at 59 schools last year. And so I imagine this year... In moving to the Kentucky Exposition Center in Louisville, we will have room for 6,200 children. So over 6,000 children in Kentucky will be able to compete at the state tournament. That's quite the climb. I've made a note here, Lisa. The very first state championship for archery had about 600 kids. And so now you're at 6,000? 600 kids represented those original 21 schools in 2002 we had last year we had 685 schools that were active in the program you came out here a little bit before we recorded the program and i played you an old show from kentucky field radio in 2002 and roy grimes was on there saying what do you say next few years we'd like to have 50 50 120 i think their original vision was to have 120 schools within three years, thinking that 120 counties in Kentucky, if if they could reach one middle school per county within three years, and that 120 school number, I think, was met within the first year of the program. Well, it's met its goals. It's certainly met its goals. Oh, yes. This is funny. When you talk about in Kentucky and you talk about Kentucky Horse Park, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The first Kentucky archery tournament. Yeah. We don't think horses. At least you and I don't, and a lot of kids don't. A lot of parents and uh, school administrators, they hear the word horse park. That was the very first archery championship. It was out in this big arena. 
And it was something to see. 600 kids. We had never seen anything as huge in our lives. Were you there? I was not there. I, it was a, uh, I had only heard about it. I was introduced to the program just after that as an article that had uh, appeared in Kentucky Teacher Magazine. You were a teacher. Where were you teaching I was, in 2003? I was teaching at the time at an independent school system in Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt Independent Schools at Second Street School. I was teaching middle school mathematics, and as I read this article, I thought how wonderful uh, about engaging students into the classroom. I thought it would be a great incentive for kids to come to school every day and be engaged in the classroom if they thought they had an activity that they could earn. So I started teaching archery on Fridays in my math classroom if they showed up every day and if they were engaged in the classroom. And they came. Their attendance was better. I bet their grades improved. And I had all of these little faces looking into the gym asking me why I was teaching my math classes, but not giving them an opportunity. So that's where an after-school program was created for Frankfurt Independent. The archery in the schools program was intended to be taught in physical education classes, PE class. I think that it was intended that way. I think that the original vision was to because it makes sense that it would be taught in a PE classroom. I think I broke the mold and uh, let Mr. Grimes and everyone else know that it was not limited to PE class. My children went into the gym, and we learned math by teaching archery. I remember one lesson. I had all kinds of measuring tools out. So I guess there's, there's a lot of numbers, a lot of measurements. A lot of measurements. There's a lot of vocabulary, circumference, and diameter. Scorekeeping. And scorekeeping. And in doing that, of course, I, I taught them the 11 steps to archery success. We talked about eye dominance. We talked about proper form, shooting form. We learned archery, too, but we did that in terms of mathematics. Last year, in our reporting across the nation... 70% of archery was being taught in PE class because it makes sense. That makes sense. What's the other 30? Everywhere else. Math class, English class, social studies. Think about the history of archery. Think about how America became, you know, and the United States became the United States. Our whole country was, was founded on people coming in and, and hunting for a living. Yeah. Talking about history. It's been around long enough to where it seems like oh, we've always had this, and we haven't. These are the early days. You're number three in Kentucky in this position. A program that started in Kentucky, 2002, that's now worldwide with 47 states, 11 countries, 2.4 million kids within, like you said, 15 years. Let's think about other programs that have 2.4 million kids involved. Little League is among those, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. So th this past year, probably a little more, but still around 2 million kids involved in Girl Scouts. That program has been around for hundreds of years. Yeah. Well, could it, is it safe to say that maybe Girl Scouts has, has maxed out? Have they reached all the little girls they're going to or all the little girls? Will there come a time when we reach all the student archers? I don't think so. As our population grows, our program should grow. Will we plateau is w what I always think. Well, there's football and basketball and band and everything else out there that a kid can get involved with. But we're seeing kids involved in those programs but that are also involved in ours. But we're also seeing a majority of children that are not involved in any other sport but they found their niche in archery. You used the word a little while ago. They are engaged. They finally have something they can latch on to and feel like they're a part of. It makes them better. They have fun doing it. Makes them want to come to school. You think about success. For one child, that success may mean being a part of their school, finally feeling like they are a part of something. 
for another child, it may be competing in the score. But I don't think the majority of the children across the nation look at their success in archery that has anything to do with a score. You're competing against other teams, but mostly you're competing against yourself. How well did you do this time compared to what you did last time? And research shows, Lisa, striving to improve rubs off not just in archery scores, but in test scores, the study habits, friendships, posture, I mean, you name it. Lisa Fry, Kentucky's new NASP archery coordinator. Stay tuned, you're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. We're back on Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. We all seem to sleep a little better at night when we have people in positions that we trust. Thousands of student archers and school coaches should be resting a little more easy now that we have a new archery coordinator in place. Her name is Lisa Fry. Patrick O'Connell has retired. Lisa is hired. And a goal of Patrick's, Lisa, was to have every school in the state program in archery. Wouldn't that be grand to have every single school in Kentucky? That was his goal. said, I want them all. Didn't get them all, so now it's your job. That's it. That's my goal. Of course, you can't just impose this on a school they do it because they have the gym time and they have the money and they have the personnel to do it and certainly they have the kids interest but it's uh, there's a lot going on on a school teacher administrator's plate oh absolutely after teaching for 27 years you certainly learn that our goal is certainly to reach as many schools as we can because we know the benefits for the children and the intent is to bring archery lessons into the school day at some point during the school year because we want as many children as we can introduced to a shooting sport. What if they say, oh, my kid goes to conservation camp, or they go to 4-H, go to scout camp, or they shoot bows and arrows here and there. Doesn't that count? Is that the same thing? It's not the same thing. And we have used, like you said, back at the horse park, we used a tournament as a culminating activity to bring the kids together to see how other children across the state uh, were doing the same activity and enjoying the same activity. So it's kind of like a a yearly Mm -hmm. get-together. Of course, in Kentucky, we're getting, it grew so much, then we added regional tournaments. The tournament is something extra. The team is extra, right? Correct. It's a natural progression. Um, The schools introduce archery, and from there, they can choose what they want to do. It's just that the kids love it so much that that two-week PE class just isn't enough. What's their appetite? It's right. It's kind of like eating those Lay's potato chips. You can't just eat one. (laughs) It is so inclusive that I can compete with the brute dude on the football team. It's the best thing to see a fourth grader that may weigh 100 pounds and may not even be as tall as their bow shooting in the same lane as a big senior football player boy scoring better. But it's great seeing the interaction with the kids from other schools and how positive the interaction is, how encouraging the kids are toward one another, and how helpful they are. But it's neat to see the smile on those big football player faces when they see that it has nothing to do with brute strength. Maybe I'm wrong, because I'm not out and about in the state like you have been over the years at local tournaments, regional tournaments. But I have not noticed as far as the state level, the national, or the world level, and you have thousands upon thousands of kids there, they all get along. You go to a football game, and you've got one side against another, the other side. and they're doing their chance, and, you know, we're going to get you. I don't see that at all in archery. Everybody gets along. Right. That's not the reason they're shooting. They're not shooting for a score. The tournaments to them is a chance to get together with other kids that are liking the same sport that they like. And it is. It's great when you are at a state or a national meet when the kids are mealing around and talking with each other 
uh, especially nationally when they get to meet kids from other schools. My story about a national was being caught in an elevator with my own children and some archers from Alaska. My children were complaining about riding a school bus. Those children looked at my children and said, you mean you ride a school bus? You know, one of those big yellow things? And my girls were like, yes, it's horrible. And they're like, oh, we would give anything to be able to ride one of those school buses. And so my girls were like, but how do you go to school? They said, well, you know, we take a ferry over to the island, and then we take a hopper over to the mainland. And my kids are like, what do you mean a hopper? And they're like, well, it's like a little airplane. And then my kids' eyes got huge. They're like, you ride an airplane Mm. to school? We would like to ride an airplane. We'll switch with you. So it opens up their eyes geographically. Children just assume that other children go to school and do the same thing they do day in and day out. Do you have a date yet for the state tournament? We do. The state tournament will be Friday, March 31st, and Saturday, April 1st. I'm writing that down now. Okay, so we have in mid-February the regionals, and Friday the 31st of March, and the first day of April for the state tournament. There is a change of venue this year. The place where the state tournament has been held, the Kentucky International Convention Center, downtown Louisville is being renovated, and that's in effect for this year and next? The next three years. The next three. So we will be at, for sure, we will be at the Kentucky Exposition Center. So that's where the national tournament is held. Where the national tournament is held. Okay, so that's easy to get to. Parking probably a little easier there for the kids. A lot easier, especially for our buses. So if you're having the tournament held at the Exposition Center... And the facility-wise, size-wise, far and away larger than the International Convention Center downtown, you can have more participation. How many? 2,000 more. We were going to go from around 4,200 kids to 6,200 kids. 6,200 kids. This will be a two-day tournament, two full days? Two full days. So as far as teams that are vying to get in, last year we had 59, and you had to stop at 59, the top 59 teams. What's that look like this year? Do you have a clue? I'm looking at the top 70 to the top 80. So it's not broken down in scores now. It's just if you're the top 70. It would be, let's say 70. It would be all the scores across the regional tournaments. Um, your top, your your top seventy elementary, your top seventy middle, your top seventy high school. Got to be pretty good. Again, your, your number of schools are growing. So just because you're in the top seventy, seventieth doesn't mean that you're lousy. You can still be seventieth and still be pretty good. In Kentucky, we've found that you could be eightieth or the the hundredth and be within just a few points. These Kentucky archers amaze me. They do. They have written the book, and I think you can justifiably say that because they've had, they've been at it longer than anybody else in the nation. started here in 2002. When people ask me, what do I need to score to be first place? And I ask them if they know what a perfect score is. And they're like, well, certainly, 300. I said, well, I've seen the 300s. How many 300s have you seen? I in- have. I have only seen one. I have seen many 299s, yeah. 298s. It is so big. Now, you, if, let me put it this way. If you've ever been to the state fair and you've gone into what they call the South Wing, and in there there'll be arts and crafts and all kinds of booths and a trade show and the shop where you can buy everything from getting your glasses clean to fudge, that hall is pure archery during the national tournament. Seems like there are 300 targets and, 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 and maybe even more. If you've ever been to one of those, it's uh, more it's mind-boggling. Our state tournament will have 240 targets in one of the halls. Will this state tournament involve the NASP IBO 3D Challenge? Yes. The students will be allowed um, to register if they wish to shoot in the NASP IBO 3D Challenge. 
This is a first for the state tournament. It will be the first for the state tournament, but it's an interest that we see. The kids love shooting at the 3D animals. Let's say you have inspired someone to say, I should look at this for my school. Maybe I'm a teacher, I'm a coach of something else, or I'm a parent. And What's the school's first step? They can call me. They can go on to the fish uh, wildlife website at fw.ky.gov and underneath education, look at the NASP page. There is a document that says, how do I get started? The first thing that I would say to them is they need a basic archery instructor and then start thinking about fundraising or raising the funds to get a startup kit of equipment which would run the schools around three thousand thirty two hundred dollars based on what targets they want to use in their mm-hmm. school to some of us that doesn't sound like a lot for but for a school district three thousand dollars is quite a bit of money you have to think about it but then there's an outcome for the kids that they're going to be engaged they're mm-hmm. going to show up they're going to be better students yes lisa thanks so much for coming out thank you so much To learn more about Kentucky Archery in the Schools program, visit the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website, fw.ky.gov. Click the Education tab and you'll find all the information that you need. Up next, our fishing report, and then we will chat with a national NASP general manager, Dr. Tommy Floyd. See what's happening new on the national and world scene. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Baglin back on Kentucky Afield Radio. If you'd like to hear this show again or share it with someone who maybe has a kid in NASP or an archer themselves, it's easily done. Just go to YouTube and you can... Find us there. Just put in Kentucky Afield Radio in the search box. Like us on Facebook under the Kentucky Afield Radio heading. Plus, we are a podcast on iTunes. Just ahead, the Vice President of Everything NASP on the World and National Scene, Tommy Floyd, is our guest. First up, our weekly fishing report. In western Kentucky, down at the two big lakes, Kentucky and Barclays, fishing is starting to really pick up for that fall season and early winter season. The lake is about 354, 355 elevation. We've had a little rain, so the water's come up just a tad bit. The water temperature's in the mid to upper 50s. And so bass fishing and crappie fishing is kind of what everybody's talking about right now, mainly crappie fishing. The crappie are suspended over brush piles, fishing minnows and jigs around those brush piles, spider rigging, drift fishing, and even going up shallow, trying some of the stake beds. Now, the water level is low, so you have to find some stake beds and and some brush piles that still have some water on them, but back up in the flats where you can find some shallow water habitat, minnow fishing, jig fishing around that for crappie. Well, this is Paul Reister, and hope you find a good day to go fishing. Hi, this is Eric Cummins with your Southwest Kentucky Fishing Report. Barren River Lake is at Winter Pool, and the bass bite has been good at the mouths of feeder creeks and transition areas using crawdad and shad baits, either soft plastic crankbaits or jigs. Crappie have also been good in 8 to 12 foot on brush or structure on the bluffs or channel drops. At Green River Lake, the lake is approaching Winter Pool. Best fishing is above Lone Valley and the Corbin's Bend areas due to turnover in the lower parts of the lake. Bass have been good on crawdad and shad imitations. Barren River tailwater has been excellent for crappie, walleye hybrids, and catfish with live bait or shad imitators. Green River Lake tailwater action likewise has been good for walleye. As always, good luck and good fishing. Be sure your life jacket's got your back. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central Fisheries District Fishing Report. Water temperatures at our large lakes are running into mid to lower 50s, while our smaller lakes, such as as Elmer and Beaver and Corinth are running in the lower 50s to upper 40s. Largemouth fishing is good at many of our district lakes. It's a great time of year to cast jerk bait or crank bait. Concentrate your efforts on main lake points as well as secondary points and creek arms. Fishing pockets along the shoreline can also be very productive for catching a few fish this time of year. Crappie are still being caught at many of our area lakes. Harrington, Beaver, Elmer, Boats, and especially Taylor's the Lake, caught on live minnows and crappie jigs uh, when fished around brush or treetops in 6 to 12 feet of water. Remember to dress appropriately when fishing in colder weather and always wear your life jacket. 
Christmas means deer season in more ways than one. Have the Jolly Reindeer drop off the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife gift certificate. Perfect for anyone on your list who has hunting on theirs. Find it at fw.ky.gov. Boys, we're in trouble. A true story. And it sunk right out from under us. Perfect for duck hunting, but not for a swim in the middle of a river. My hands were so cold in a matter of seconds that I couldn't pop the clip on my waders to get them off. There's no time to react when your world just sinks out from under you. Three hunters, two survivors, one reason. Your life jacket's got your back. Your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, your life jacket's got your back. And the backing of sportsmen on winter water everywhere. The magazine you can't put down can at least be placed under your arm while you're opening gifts. Kentucky Afield Magazine. One of the many gifts you can give with a Kentucky Fish and Wildlife gift certificate online at fw.ky.gov. Dear Mom, thank you for all the times you told me to go outside. Putting me on trails put me on the right path. If you wrote Mother Nature a letter, what would you say? That's easy. Thanks. Thank you so much. You're amazing. And so are you. If your license plate at home or at work says nature's finest, you've helped protect nearly 100,000 wilderness acres across our state for all to enjoy. And we're not done yet. Explore more at heritageland.ky.gov. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio, and my name is Charlie Baglin. Our show this hour is about archery, more specifically about a sport activity that is in more than half of the state schools in Kentucky, and is growing around the world and nationally by a thousand schools a year. And it's a program that's paying off. Better grades, better attendance, it creates a student that is more life-ready, more career-ready. And Dr. Tommy Floyd is the vice president and the general manager of NASP. Talk to me about how archery is helping kids make the grade. Academic archer came about as a way to recognize kids who were academically successful. Think of it as honor roll for archery. These kids are examples for other kids, regardless of whether they're elementary, middle, or high school. So if they make honor roll at Smith Elementary or Smith Middle, they're eligible if their coach wants to put them into and they participate in, on the NAS program, they're eligible for academic archer. Last year, uh, we gave away 10 Genesis bows and 10 dozen arrows marked academic archer to kids nationwide, had them scattered out all through, had a winner or two from Kentucky, had one as far as Alaska. What's new for this year with academic archer is that Easton Technical Products, Mark Pizzoni, the uh, president at Easton Archery, and Terry Garrett with Easton Technical Products, uh, and Roy Grimes and I worked on Easton Technical Products becoming our sponsors. Last year, we closed out the program with actually a short window with 8,500-plus kids. I think there were 8,513. We're hoping for a lot bigger turnout. I know states like Georgia and others have fully embraced the program. My understanding is that Georgia is in the process of providing banners for every school that participates in academic archery. Um, a lot of schools are, are giving the patches to the students that win it. And then some states, the schools themselves are doing the patches. Now, the patches aren't a moneymaker for us in any way, and I want to clear that up. The patches are just, we're selling the patches for enough to sell the patches. We just want to encourage people to use it if they want to. Uh, we're also talking about um, chevrons, which show the year, because this is year two. We'll have kids who are second-year academic archers. Sure. But probably the most exciting part of academic archer, Easton is talking about some additional benefits for academic archers now that they're the sponsor. I think you're going to see some additional giveaways at the national tournament. I think you're going to see a, an Easton presence, possibly a Hoyt presence at our national tournament, which is a first. And that's because the folks at Easton are involved in academic archer. But what's Charlie, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that we're talking about academic archer because it made us realize at NASP we have a window to reach kids for post-secondary awareness. Many of the kids who participate in NAS tell us they don't want to stop shooting archery after they graduate. So we're putting together a network of where they can find opportunities at the college or post-secondary level to continue some type of archery participation. But to get there, they've got to be ready. So we're actually going to work with several partners 
to design a way to communicate with kids that are academic archers for post-secondary awareness. We have some excellent tools out there on how to go to post-secondary. And as we both know, being ready for post-secondary education is also very important to your, to your earning potential, the decisions you get to make for your future family when you've got that additional education and can get a better job, or you exhibit some skills from career and technical education opportunities where you learn how to do some things that put you in a different income bracket. And we want that for every kid, especially every kid that does NASP. I can see this now. You go to a tournament 12 years from now, and you see the academic archer patch, say, on their jacket. Now, granted, they're going to have grown in the last 12 years, but underneath mm -hmm. that you would have chevrons with the years right. dating back That's every right. year. And That's right. I think the goal would be great if, if there were how many years now of eligibility? Eight? Fourth grade, four yeah. through 12? Yeah. Then mm -hmm. you could have eight theoretically eight underneath that, that one patch with all the years. Mm -hmm. That would be nice to see a child yes, be able it would. to do that. I, and I think there's people out there across our country who would want to embrace anything that promotes academic success for kids. Some of those folks might not even be archery-related companies or organizations, but they, they're they definitely pro-kid sure. and pro-academic success. I think that a kid deserves a pat on the back, and when they get that, they feel good about what they're doing and will turn around and do an even better job. Yes, sir. I've heard it likened to employees where you could say, you know, you treat me like I make a difference, and I will. I also think that you got to think nationally. We're in 47 states and 11 other countries, 2.43 million people, students, grades 4 through 12, were in NASP last year. If more of those kids know how to get to post-secondary as they're keeping up their grades, in, in grades 4 through 12, they put themselves in a lot different position than those that get behind. And for those that are behind, academic archer has been something, according to educators, they use as a motivator for everybody on their team. Let's talk about post-secondary. I'd asked Lisa Fry in the past half hour. I said, what is waiting after high school graduation in the field of archery. Well, I know one, you could join the ranks of sportsmen and go out and hunt you some deer and turkey, just like you're doing. But yes, sir. what else is there out there that NASP is helping to put in place? Well, there are, there are opportunities with some of our Kentucky colleges, especially at the club level. Some of our Kentucky schools have a team level. There's multiple 3D opportunities that are out there for people to get involved with. USA Archery has opportunities. We are right now in the process of putting together a map by state which lists the opportunities for kids post-secondary to do what you're talking about, and that is to know where to go and participate in archery activities out there across the United States. I'll tell you, if you haven't seen it, you really ought to go online and check out what Georgia is doing with their academic archery program. Those folks, Jennifer and those folks down there are on fire uh, for what they, they think a lot of schools are going to be more receptive to NASP as a program when they learn what NASP is doing toward academic recognition. For many of these kids, it'll be the first time they've been recognized for not archery, but academics. So we're real excited about that. Is it as simple as Googling academic archer? Or what's, your web, what's your web address? You can get on our, our naspschools.org website and go to Instructor Resources. And you can find all you want to find about academic art. Thanks, Charlie, for asking that question. Certainly. I've, so, I've been on your website lately, and I've seen a one new video for sure, maybe two. We're in the process right now of producing two videos. One is a safety video, which we're going to ask every BAI, or basic archery instructor, to watch each year. It's going to kind of spell out some of the same stuff that our BAI refresher course uh, or the refresher DVD covers. Just kind of a, a reminder before people get starting to shoot, safety is something that we have kind of built ourselves around, having a perfect safety record. And our coaches and teachers that you know implement NASP in our communities, they're the reason. So this safety video, we wanted to be proactive. The second video that I'm talking about is a scoring protocol. At the coordinators conference this summer, we actually discussed and implemented a slight change in our scoring protocol. So that video, the scoring protocol, went out to coordinators. Now, we're making a revision 
one good thing about having all these people give you feedback is we did have two or three things in our video we wanted to edit. So what's really changed about the scoring protocol? We're changing the steps so that archers can visualize the arrows in the target as the score sheet is being filled out. And there's a checkbox indicating that if, if you've got archer A and B, as archer, archer A calls out the arrows, archer B is actually able to watch rather than be looking at the paper. It's just more of an accountability uh, we were, we were, this is directly from feedback to try to increase accountability for the kids to not put kids in a position where they might intentionally or even accidentally miss score and end of arrows. We're just trying to increase the accuracy of what kids do with their bows and arrows versus a mistake in scoring. So we, we've timed it. The, the time difference is very irrelevant. Small amount of difference and it's just going to have to be something that folks get used to. We thought the video would be the best way for coaches to view the video, for students to view the video a couple of times, and it's nothing. Kids are very adaptable, and this is just a better scoring method for accountability. We have the ability for the kid to be able to view the, the, the items or view the arrows as the score is going down and then check the box decided to say that they're in agreement with the scorecard as is. I like the idea of the Student Advisory Council, and out of that, last year you had the On Target for Life Awards. And, Buddy, I don't know if there was anybody at that uh, national tournament listening now. There wasn't a dry eye in the house because these were students who were saying, we want to honor these people in the program who are often behind the scenes. Are those nominees open now? We are taking it. opened up October 1. It, too, is on our website, on Target for Life Awards, and on our website. You can, you can find out how to nominate someone, Coach of the Year. We... Tom Patterson from Trigg County, and if you know Tom, he's unbelievable in what he's done for his community through archery. He knows more tips and tricks, but not just about how to shoot a bow, but how to make better people. Um, we, we've had we had you know an, a, a bullseye award winner from up north in Wisconsin. Uh, we had a volunteer of the year. We had a community service award. Uh, we had we had some folks who had overcome adversity, uh, and it, it was just a very moving experience. Tommy, I'll ask if we can just hold it there for a minute. The music is playing, and up next, we will talk world and national tournaments and scholarship money that's really helping archers to take aim on a college education. More in a minute. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We're back on Kentucky Field Radio. I'm Charlie Baglin. Our final few minutes with Dr. Tommy Floyd, who is the Vice President and the General Manager of the National Archery in the Schools Program, what kids refer to as NASP. Thomas, a few minutes left and a few things to hit. First up, the 2017 World and National Tournaments. Louisville is where we have the, the current national tournament. That will be in May. Our world tournament, we're going to be going to a really neat venue. I think everyone's going to enjoy it. It's going to be in June, and it's going to be at the Orange County Convention Center in Orlando. Now, I made the trip down there to look over the facility, and it's simply unbelievable. It's not far from SeaWorld. It's not far from Disney, and very beautiful. The, the facade, when you first come in until you enter those big hallways, it's like a fine hotel meets a gigantic arena. So there's plenty to do for kids and families that attend Worlds this coming summer in Orlando, Florida. We're always looking at what we can do, and I, and I hope you and I get to mention just briefly about the proposed Western National. Do that. I saw a press release on that on your website. We are actually considering same scale of what we have in Louisville going on at Salt Lake City, Utah. We found a venue. We've talked about a contract. We've got the details. To provide... Uh, an exciting national venue that's closer geographically than than Kentucky might be for some of those western states. And based on the feedback data, I, I think we're hoping to have several thousand students attend the first conference or first tournament there. I think we're looking at 2018 in the in the in the month of April, which would occur before the Louisville tournament in May, and, and give those western states a chance at something a little closer. We're excited about that. Our coordinators out there seem to be very excited. We think by establishing some form of a big Western tournament that in time you could see the two halves coming together for some type of a U.S. championship or something else. 
One thing I don't want to get off the air without talking to you about is a new partnership that NASP has done with IBO. Talk to uh, me. The International Bow Hunting Organization. Brian Markham is the president. IBO and NASP have joined together. Uh, IBO is getting ready to announce they have hired a person to be their uh, a director, if you would, who is going to work with all participating NASP states and offer a 3D experience with the Genesis bow. Uh, there's a there's a there's a course that students can can compete, and if and as you well know because you've been at our national tournaments, we've had this in place now for a couple of years. But, uh, the state tournaments are going to provide a direct pathway to get to the national 3D tournament. We're going to call it the IBO 3D Challenge, and it is something that every student that participates in NASP that wants to, only if they want to participate, it will be available. So a lot of states are taking advantage of this, and, and they're, they're interested in how they can make the IBO 3D Challenge a part of their state tournament. And then those kids would be on track, just like our bullseye tournaments, to earn a, a lane assignment at our national tournament in Louisville. So as you well know from your long experience in Mass, Charlie, it's another example of where students asked for, you even asked me this question in this interview, what is next for me? Well, we think a lot of students are going to be excited about the 3D venue, and for those that choose not to participate, it isn't in any way mandatory. It's strictly an optional. What I like about the 3D challenge, though, is that uh, a lot of kids will take that natural next step, and some of those kids may end up bow hunting, but a lot of those kids will find out that the circles on the animals are the exact same size as our uh, bullseye targets so that a coach that works with his or her student on aiming point and shooting form in bullseye will find that the unknown distance of somewhere between 10 and 15 meters is applicable to that 3D animal. So we're really encouraged by our, how receptive folks seem to be about the IBO 3D Challenge, and we're excited to be partners with an organization like the IBO. They just don't come any finer than Brian Markham. And we're real excited about what this means. I think you'll see a lot more interest in the 3D challenge in Kentucky. Lisa Fry is already very aware of it. She is I aware. Think, yeah. yeah. And I there's going Kentucky to be a component. State tournament. If you come to the Kentucky State Tournament, you will see the IBO 3D challenge if you haven't ever seen it. And, again, uh, another opportunity to serve kids. Let me ask you one question that I've had on my mind because it's come up to me before. You take a facility where you have 14,000 children, and they all have bows and arrows, mm -hmm. and say, I would love to come to this, but I'm scared. And I said, why? You know, this is the safest sport a child could ever participate in. Talk to me a little bit, Tommy, about the safety protocols with archery. NASP is one of the safest organizations. Our safety record is just impeccable. And again, as I said earlier, it goes down to the training we implement, and it goes down to the men and women across 47 states and 11 countries that go by that training protocol. The thing about it is, if you're in NASP in South Africa or Vancouver, Canada, or the British Virgin Islands, you shoot off the same whistle commands, you shoot the same distances, you shoot the same protocols. It's extremely safe because it's consistent. It's actually, I think, table tennis is the only thing which is uh, denoted as safer than what we're doing. Right now, with 2.43 million a year and 16 million having gone through the program since 2002, the fact that we've made safety such an important part of what we do goes right up there with the in-school requirement. Uh, we want to expose it to everybody, and we want it to be something that they can be exposed to safely. I would say that if uh, adults haven't seen something like our state or national tournament before, they ought to try to come out in May, and they ought to try to visit the Kentucky Expo Center and uh, get involved. And anybody that's already involved will tell you that it's just an unbelievable feat that you, Mr. Baglin, have seen many times unfold waves of people coming in and waves of people going out replaced by new people. Yeah. We're going, to, we're going to shoot over 14,000, and it's going to be something to see. We'll do it on the same whistle commands that they do at their home gym somewhere else. And uh, I think that lends itself to our safety record. Talk to me about scholarships. 
I'm proud to announce that next year, following the national tournament, I think it will be established that NASP, National Archery and Schools Program, will break the $1 million mark with, with, with respect to scholarships. We will have given away $1 million for post-secondary two, four-year institutions or the military. Congratulations. Um, no, it's just it's a great thing. And, but, but you've got a lot of people out there who've decided that it's something they want to invest in. And um, it's something that they uh, saw benefit in. And we've got some incredible sponsors, some who give hundreds of thousands of dollars over time. And they, they see what it does for kids. I will tell you the story that one of the coaches from Western Kentucky told me that her, one of her students won a $500 scholarship. And you think about that $500 scholarship. That's not going to pay for a whole well, lot of college. If you have zero, day, 500 right? a lot. But. but she told her coach that now that she'd won this $500 scholarship, she was a ninth grader. She hadn't really thought about going to college, but now she wasn't going to let this scholarship go to waste. Uh, she, got, she was going to get busy discovering what she had to do to be ready for post-secondary. And I think that's, I think that's a win. That's the story right there. Yes, sir. Never thought about it until she had that opportunity. Exactly. That's great. Okay. Thanks. Tell Pam hello. I will. Dr. Tommy Floyd of the National Archery in the Schools program. You can learn more about NASP at large at the naspschools.org website. And in Kentucky, just go to fw.ky.gov and click the Education tab. We are out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us in a week, and we'll go inside outdoors again right here on Kentucky Field Radio. Thank you.